Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're going to be talking about bugs. <laughs> In many different forms. Indeed. First, though, a couple of pieces of feedback. We got some really nice comments about the Arrival episode, and at least a couple of people who went to try to watch Arrival. <laughs> Unfortunately, it appears that it isn't on US Netflix either yet or still. My guess is still. It must have been on US earlier. Netflix earlier. Normally, the problem is that we don't get what the US has. So I always assume that if Canada has it, surely everybody has mm. it. But I guess we were wrong. Anyway, I apologize if we sent you scurrying to Netflix and it wasn't there. <laughs> But we did get a couple of specific comments that I wanted to call out. Uh, in particular, Laura from the Feast podcast mentioned to me that Song Exploder, which is another podcast, did an episode with the creator of the soundtrack mm -hmm. about, in particular, the song that plays over the montage when they're sort of learning the language. Right. Heptapod B, I think it's called. Right. <laughs> And, and I listened to that and thank you for the recommendation, Laura. It was really interesting. So I commend that as well to anyone who was interested in the music or the soundscape of Arrival because it was a really interesting soundtrack and it was an interesting podcast. And the other comment that I wanted to pass along was from a friend, Jeff, who on Facebook mentioned that he really recommends, adds the recommendation to what we'd already said, that we read the short story that Arrival's based on, which I still haven't had a chance to do. Yeah, several people when talking about the film say, but you got to read the story. Yeah. So in particular, he said that Sapir Wharf isn't actually mentioned in the short story. Right. It certainly isn't cited, cited explicitly. And it kind of deals with the question of how the language affects the ability to perceive time a bit differently. Mm -hmm. So from that linguistic point of view, mm -hmm. it'd be interesting to compare what the story does. And it also is apparently goes into much more depth about the physics of the alien world and ship. Right. right. In particular, apparently it stops halfway through for a page of uh, formulae <laughs> <laughs> and math problems. It may not be unconnected that our friend Jeff is a mathematician. <laughs> so that might be part of why he likes mm -hmm. it. No, I am sure he is right that it is a very worthwhile story. And I just haven't had a chance to read it. Yeah. So we will add that to our reading list. Yeah, exactly. So thanks, Jeff, for that comment, and thanks, Laura, for the recommendation for the Song Exploder episode. Next, I want to thank a new patron on Patreon, Dan Lizot, who is a friend on Twitter that we've been chatting with and who recently pledged to Patreon. So thank you very much, Dan. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And as always, do check out patreon.com slash The Endless Knot if you're interested in finding out how you could support this podcast and the videos we make. And we appreciate everyone who has done so. All right, that's all the feedback. So today we're going to be talking about bug. Indeed. So this is another one of the episodes based on a previous video. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be playing the voiceover in a moment, and then we'll come back and talk about that and issues arising from it. But we are drinking cocktails today. However, we're going to make a bit of a challenge for you. It's not much of a challenge. I'm going to tell you what we're drinking and what it is. And then your challenge is to listen to the voiceover and see if you can figure out why we chose this cocktail. And then we'll tell you afterwards. So we are drinking grasshoppers. You may think it's really obvious why we're doing it, but there is a secondary reason. Yes. A Find the secondary reason. Yes. That's what yes. you can do. A grasshopper is uh, equal parts creme de menthe, creme de cacao, and cream. Very, very creamy. creamy. Yes. <laughs> Cheers. Mm. I like it. Yeah. It tastes exactly like mint ice cream, chocolate mint ice cream, or a chocolate mint milkshake. It's not my favorite thing. I'm not a fan of mint. Not this kind of mint anyway. Peppermint flavoring. Mm. But it's fine. It's creamy and sweet and has chocolate in it. I'm not normally into uh, creamy drinks, but... Uh, this but I you like. are into chocolate mint. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you're a big fan of chocolate mint. So, yeah, fair enough. All right. So we will go on and play the voiceover now and keep an ear out for why we chose that cocktail. And then we'll come back and talk about a lot more bugs. For such a simple-seeming word, bug has a remarkably complicated origin story, coming, it seems, from at least two sources, the first being British folklore. In Middle English, the word bug referred to a terrifying creature out of folklore, like a hobgoblin, and this sense is still preserved in the related terms bugbear, bugaboo, bogey, and boogeyman, as well as a number of other similarly named creatures. 
All of these similar words refer to mischievous folkloric beings or spirits or ghosts, particularly in Britain or other northern European areas, and may stem from a similar folk belief in the Middle Ages. The earliest attestation of the word in Middle English actually refers to a scarecrow. As to where this Middle English bug comes from, one possibility is that this supernatural creature was once some kind of goat-like being, not uncommon in many folklores, and thus the word comes from the same Indo-European root that gives us the word buck. Alternatively, bug may come from an Indo-European root that means to boil, swell, or puff up, which lies behind many other English words, not only boil and puff, but also big, pock, and booger, or bogey if you're British. This swelling sense seems to lie behind the expression bug-eyed, though the usage isn't attested in writing until the 19th century. In any case, the sense of a frightening creature has evidently been watered down to mean something simply annoying, something that bugs you, just like bugbear which now simply means an annoyance. And this less frightening sense may have something to do with another similar sounding word that seems to have merged with bug. Old English butta meaning beetle, which is only attested in compound words such as sharn butta, meaning dung beetle, sounds enough like bug that the two may have fallen together, and by the 17th century the word bug starts to be used to refer to insects, initially bedbugs, and eventually any insect. One imagines that the fact that insects such as bedbugs are potentially frightening, or at least annoying, help these words merge as well. It's also uncertain where Old English butta comes from, but it might be connected with our modern English word bud, as in a shoot or seed pod, and might ultimately come from that same Proto-Indo-European root that means to swell. In a formal scientific sense, the word bug now ought to refer only to the order of insects Hemiptera, which includes bedbugs, but colloquially bug is used to refer to any insect, and sometimes even to other non-insects such as spiders as well as the sense pathogen or germ which develops in the early 20th century from this insect sense. In fact there have been quite a few slang senses of the word bug over the years, and perhaps the most common now is referring to a computer bug, a flaw or malfunction in a computer software. The story behind this sense that's often told is that shortly after World War II when celebrated computer scientist Grace Hopper, who is particularly known for inventing the first computer language compiler, and for her role in the development of the COBOL programming language, was working on the Harvard Mark II computer in the US Navy Research Lab, she coined the term bug when it was found that there was a moth caught in the relay causing the machine to malfunction. However, the logbook entry for this event, which even preserves the moth taped to the page, makes it clear that the term was already in common use, and the scientists were simply joking that this was the first actual case of a bug being found. This sense of bug had actually been around in engineering circles for over 50 years. It can in fact be traced back at least as far as the 1870s, when inventor Thomas Edison used the word in his notebooks to refer to problems in the telegraph equipment he was working on. The telegraph was a system of sending a coded electrical signal, usually Morse code, along a wire, the first electric communication system. Morse code was named after artist Samuel Morse, who turned inventor and helped develop the single line telegraph the first really commercially viable system, out of grief after news of his wife's illness reached him too late to return home while he was out of town. Edison, who began his career as a telegraph operator, soon began to work on improving the equipment and applying for various patents for his work. Whether Edison coined the term bug himself, or whether it was already common in the telegraphy world is uncertain, and whether this new sense really grew out of the notion of an insect in the machine, or some sort of mischievous spirit in the machine, think bugbear or simply a worrying or annoying problem, is also unclear. What is clear is that this sense of the word made its public debut in an 1889 article in the Pall Mall Gazette on Edison's work on the phonograph, his first really major invention. Mr. Edison, I was informed, had been up the two previous nights discovering a bug in his phonograph, an expression for solving a difficulty, and implying that some imaginary insect had secreted itself inside and is causing all the trouble. Edison is of course known for the many patents he held, 1093 in the United States, many of which were for work actually done by employees working in his famous Menlo Park research lab, and for some high profile patent disputes with other inventors. But a word can't be patented, and this new sense of the word that Edison pioneered spread quickly. Speaking of the phonograph, Edison invented this first really viable sound recording technology in 1877. It recorded sound by etching small bumps in a groove on a cylinder that corresponded to sound vibrations. Some time later, German-born inventor Emil Berliner, who emigrated to the United States to avoid the Franco-Prussian War, 
further developed sound recording technology with his gramophone, which used the record disc more familiar today. Berliner's gramophone records took a while to overtake Edison's early start, but eventually won this early format war, giving us the ubiquitous record albums of the 20th century. And speaking of Edison and Berliner, and patent disputes, both men simultaneously invented the carbon microphone, the first design that was effective enough for use in telephone communication. It involves two plates of metal separated by granules of carbon. Sound vibrations against one of the plates causes a modulation of the electrical current passing through the setup, which can then be transmitted along a wire. After years of legal wrangling, Edison won the patent, so I guess the Edison versus Berliner scorecard is even. But the funny thing is, neither of them was the real first inventor of the carbon microphone, which was first developed by English scientist David Edward Hughes. And what's more, he seems to have been the first to coin the term microphone, at least in its electronic sense. But unlike Edison and Berliner, Hughes chose not to patent his work, wanting it to be freely available for the good of scientific progress, a notion similar to what we would now call open source or public domain. Of course the idea of patents is to allow inventors exclusive ability to profit from their inventions for a limited time, with the trade-off that the technical specs will eventually be made public. The overall purpose is to foster innovation and development. Modern patent law as we know it has its origin in the 15th century, but there may be a forerunner in ancient Greece. The ancient Greek colony Sybaris, located in what is now Italy, was so financially successful that the citizens became known for their feasting and hedonism, so much so that even today the word Sybaritic means devoted to opulent luxury. Perhaps not surprising then that cooks in Sybaris were apparently granted exclusive rights to any culinary recipe they invented for a period of one year, at least according to the Greek writer Athenaeus. Even if this report isn't true, that the idea of intellectual property could even be conceived of in the ancient world is an interesting milestone. The first patent in the modern sense was granted in another city in Italy that became extremely wealthy and known for its opulence in the Renaissance, Florence. In 1421 the Florentine architect Filippo Brunelleschi, who is best known for developing linear perspective and thus transforming Renaissance art, was granted a three year monopoly for a barge with hoisting gear for transporting marble. By 1450 the practice had become systematized in Venice, another economic powerhouse Italian city, with tenure patents, and afterward gradually spread throughout Europe. Etymologically the term patent comes from the medieval term letters patent, or literae patentes in Latin, which means open letters. Letters patent basically grants some special right or privilege, and the word patent was used in English in this broader sense from the 14th century, and from the 16th century onward in the more restricted sense that we use now. The Latin verb pateo means to be open, so there is a certain irony that now the term patent stands in opposition to the idea of open source, as in the case of Edison, Berliner and Hughes. Getting back to the microphone then, its initial purpose was telephone communication. The microphone was originally termed a transmitter. Well known is the story of Elisha Gray and Alexander Graham Bell simultaneously inventing the idea of the telephone and Bell beating Gray to the patent office by mere hours to be henceforth recognized as the official inventor of the telephone. But Bell and Gray had only crude versions of microphones, and it wasn't until the carbon microphone of Edison, or Berliner or Hughes if you will, that the telephone became a viable technology. The microphone went on to be used for things such as amplification of sound and more sophisticated sound recording, and, most important to this story, the covert listening device commonly known as a bug, a slang term first used in the 1940s. So after inventors and engineers like Edison, Bell and Morse worked the bugs out of the telecommunication technology, the spies put them back in. But where does this slang use come from? Oddly enough, it may have transferred over from the burglar alarm, which was also referred to as a bug in 1920s criminal underworld lingo. A house was said to be bugged if it was equipped with a burglar alarm. This might be because it was something annoying or to be worried about, or it might simply be a shortening of the word burglar itself, which is unrelated, but another possibility takes us back to the mythological bugaboo. Back in the 18th and early 19th century, bugaboo became a slang term for a creditor coming to collect money or a sheriff's officer, according to a glossary of slang compiled at the time and in 1828 the word made its mainstream literary debut in a novel by potboiler writer Edward Bulwer-Lytton, he of It Was a Dark and Stormy Night fame. So from bugaboo for actual police officer to bug for the automated police officer, the burglar alarm. The invention of the burglar alarm is also connected to this story. 
Of course guard animals have been used for centuries, and some had tinkered with mechanical noisemakers to signal forced entry. But it was in 1853 that Augustus Pope, a church pastor turned inventor, hit upon the idea of adapting telegraph technology to make an electric burglar alarm, which was often referred to as a burglar alarm telegraph. Pope developed his system using components from the Boston shop of Charles Williams, Jr., the premier telegraph equipment manufacturer. Williams supplied components to many of the inventors at the time, including Edison, and Bell conducted his work on the telephone in the upper floor of Williams' shop, with the assistance of Thomas Watson, he of Come Here Watson I Need You fame, who was also one of Williams' employees. Unfortunately, due to declining health, Pope was unable to continue to develop his system and sold the patent to one Edwin Holmes, sometimes mistakenly credited as its inventor, who up to that point was a sewing store owner known for making hoop skirts. Holmes took the idea from Boston to more crime-wary New York and made a big success of it, and having met Bell through his contact with Williams' equipment shop, Holmes hit upon the idea of using existing telegraph and telephone lines to connect burglar alarms to a central monitoring station. But getting back to the computer bug, though Grace Hopper didn't coin the term bug or the notion of debugging, the word debugging was also already in use in engineering circles, she is definitely associated with the debugging of computer bugs and her importance to the history of computer programming can't be overstated. There's a fairly direct line from Edison and Bell and the telegraph and telephone through Hopper and the earliest computers to the internet of today, and the great advances in both software and hardware that have come both through patents and through their opposite, open source computing. In fact, there's a saying in open source software development, which often relies on volunteers to check over code, that given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. But of course there are always people more interested in making money for themselves than in contributing to innovation, like the people called patent trolls who are known for buying up patents and trying to make money off them by suing companies for supposed infringement without any intention of actually using or developing the technology themselves. And so the internet is haunted by a new type of monster, maybe just as scary as the bugbears we started with. And we're back! <laughs> so. Have you guessed why we've chosen, chosen the drink that we have? A, a grasshopper is obviously a bug, yes. And of course, it was in honor of Grace Hopper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I made myself laugh so hard when I thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, to Grace. To Grace. <laughs> have a hopper. <laughs> all right, that's, that's all I really wanted to say. <laughs> right, to serious things. So while this particular story begins with the word bug, it actually ends up being about patents, really. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the sort of core theme that runs through it in yeah. a way. And it ended up sort of retrospectively <laughs> being the first part of a whole trilogy of videos that I made on intellectual property. Mm -hmm. So this one covers patents, and in upcoming podcasts we'll cover the other two which deal with trademark and copyright. Right. If you just can't wait, you can go and see the intellectual property playlist on our video channel, right? Yeah. Yeah. So one thing I should, you know, particularly stress is that all of the etymologies having to do with bug and related words are tentative. Right. So there is argument and... There's not a lot of really good evidence. There's not a lot of really good evidence. I mean, most of these words were probably used for a long time before they get recorded, and mm. so their Possibly origins are in a lot, are of, forms in a lot that, of different yeah. forms, so their, their origins are kind of obscure. However, a few additional pieces of information about the etymologies, that puffed up idea mm -hmm. is perhaps further supported by the fact that there is a Norwegian dialect word, bug, Mm -hmm. or bugga, which means important man. So think sort of a puffed up man. Right. right. But not in a negative sense, like an actual important man. An important man, yeah. Okay, not a self-important person. No, yeah. No. Okay. And another etymology that I found in one source that doesn't seem to have gained much traction amongst other etymologists is that it could be traced back to a West African word, baga baga, which means insect. Hmm. So um, I can see why it's tempting phonologically. Yes. And that West African word would come into the, would be available at about the right time that bug gained its insect Oh, okay. So it sense. wouldn't, so, not in the bugbear sense. Not but in the bugbear sense, but maybe the word bug in its insect sense right. came from, from this word. Hmm. Who knows? 
Before we move on then, why don't I tell you, I looked up a few of the words for various insects in Latin and Greek. I just did a very cursory search, and I'm not going to go through all of them because, of course, there's lots and lots of them. But there were a couple that amused me that I thought I would just bring up. They are not in any way, to my knowledge, etymologically associated with bug. Mm. And insect, of course, does come from Latin, mm -hmm. meaning cut up because the body is cut into pieces, the body of an insect, yeah. there's three pieces. But the Romans didn't call them insects. That's a scientific Latin right. nomenclature. So probably from early probably, modern. Yeah, I don't know exactly when. So they didn't have that word. But one word that the Greeks had for a buzzing insect was a bambulios. <laughs> bambulios for a buzzing insect, or as the dictionary put it, a humble bee. Humblebee. Now, that was online, and I didn't go and look it up on paper. Hmm. It's possible it's a transcription error online. Right. Or maybe not. Maybe humblebee is a, another, another word, for, word bumblebee. for bumblebee. Anyway, I just like that because obviously that's a, an onomatopoeic word. Hmm. I don't know that it's connected to bumble, except that they both sound the same. But it would be interesting to know if they are actually, because it is really just bambulios. Oh, what? Humblebee, yes. Humblebee? Humblebee is in the... Oxford English Dictionary, mm -hmm. known only from the 15th century, from then onwards. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. But possibly an old word representing right. an old English humble bale, mm. which doesn't, isn't attested, attested but, but could, it exist. could exist. Right. Yeah. Because there are some other Germanic cognates, humbal in Old High German and modern German, hummel. Okay. Oh, Hummel. Yeah, Hummel, right. And various other Germanic right. dialects have right. cognates. So there you go. Oh, yeah, okay. So that I just thought was interesting because of the dictionary entry as much as anything, and also because it's a fun little sounding Greek word. Another one that probably people have may have heard of is the ephemeron. The ephemeron is the mayfly. Ah. It gives us the word, well, it sort of gives us the word ephemeral. Ephemeron means for a day. Ephemeron. Okay. For a, day, for a day, on a day. So it's a mayfly, the, the little flies that hatch mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. live a day and yeah. die. Yeah. So uh, it's used figuratively in Greek to refer to mortals, how mortals, uh, unlike are, the gods, are, are like ephemeral. mayflies. They right. are ephemeral. ephemeral. Yeah. They live only a day, right. metaphorically. And that's where we get the word ephemeral, ephemeral from. So we don't get it directly from mayfly, and it's, in a sense, a re-coined word. Right. But it's nonetheless yeah. the same as ephemeral. And there's some other words here. Oh, a grasshopper, just because we're drinking grasshoppers, has multiple names, including Acris and Herpulis and Calamaya and Troxalis. So there's lots of words for grasshoppers and locusts and things like that. And you can understand that they would have been really important because they're pests. Right. And then the other thing is, I was just searching on bug in the Greek dictionary on Perseus, mm -hmm. and that brought up words that were defined with the words bugbear and bogey and bug. Right. Well, bugbear and bogey. So alfito, and I have no idea what it is. It's got a capital letter, so it must be some demon or something. Right. Or some, you know, creature. And an echo is a bogey. bogey. <laughs> as in a scary thing. Right. Yeah. I just like the fact that they had bugbear as a definition in <laughs> yes. this dictionary, yeah, yeah. you know. And then you move over to Latin. Various are not particularly exciting or interesting, but there's lucusta is a grasshopper or locust, mm. right? Right. Lucusta. Yes. A word I picked out because it just was a funny sounding word. A blatter uh -huh. is a moth. A moth. A blatter. <laughs> just like the word blatter. I don't think it's onomatopoeic. It's just funny. And then it too, there were little bugaboos <laughs> are manioli. Okay. So that's little men, I guess. I mean, manos is not a word for man in, mm. in Latin. So I don't know what manioli, but it's oli is obviously the mm. uh, diminutive right. form. So manius manioli so little scary creatures and the other one that made me laugh was terriculum which is a source of terror a fright a scarecrow or a bugbear terriculum which means literally little terrifying thing <laughs> just it's really cute it's frightening but it's a little frightening thing <laughs> terriculum so anyway just thought i'd share those because they entertained me that's all I wonder if there's a, a Latin or Greek word for bogey in the sense of booger. Oh, you know, there may well be. Um, it's the sort of word that, you know, might yeah. never get written down, though. But Yeah. I don't even know how I'd look it up, though. Mm -hmm. Snot. Like, snot, I'm not sure. Yeah. These, given these dictionaries have words like humble but be humble in them. Bee, yes. These are old dictionaries. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to look it up. But uh, on that note, 
<laughs> Why don't you continue? Okay. Well, I mentioned some of the slang senses yeah. of bug. There's some additional ones mm -hmm. that are kind of interesting that you may be aware of. And maybe you wondered why I didn't touch on them, but mm -hmm. I'll do so now. So an enthusiastic interest or person, oh, like a firebug or to catch the acting bug yeah, or something right. like that yeah. is one of them. To bug out as in to hurriedly leave a place, mm -hmm. which seems to come from US military slang. Bug-eyed monster. I mentioned bug-eyed, mm -hmm. but bug-eyed monster. This is one of the, these things that I think when I originally came across the word, I assumed what they meant were aliens with insect eyes and that that's what i always thought when yeah. i was growing up i mean a bug-eyed monster mm -hmm. is a is a sort of staple of hokey science fiction right in fact to the level that one type of science fiction i read in a sort of meta way talked about like bad science fiction that talked about bems bug-eyed monsters yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, and I'd always just assumed it was like insectoid eyes. Right. But apparently it's from that bug-eyed sense of bulging eye. Mm -hmm. So bulging You told eye me that when you were doing but, this video and I was mm -hmm. quite surprised by that. Some older slang terms though, that you may not be familiar with, to bug the writ. Any guesses as to what that might mean? The writ as in W-R-I-T, like w -R -I -T, a legal term? W-R-I-T, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is when a bailiff takes a bribe and therefore does not serve the writ or serves it, delays the okay. serving of the writ, okay. that's called bugging the writ. And so that, I suppose that connects us to that bug police officer mm -hmm. connection mm -hmm. somehow, though it's a little bit convoluted. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and by the way, that that's the source of that I mentioned, not by name, but this, this slang dictionary that was published in the late 18th, early 19th century around mm -hmm. then is by Francis Gross. This is a really interesting one. It's available online. Is so that, it just became available. Is that the one that just became available or was it a, it was, was already one? available. Oh, was yeah. Okay. I, and I used it when I did this, did this video. Right. It's available in a number of different formats. It got re-edited over the years and added to after Gross's death. So the later editions have right. stuff that he didn't originally put in there. But Gross is also the source of that bugaboo equals sheriff's officer sense. And so, yeah, we'll put a link in the in the show notes to that if you want to look through it. It's really fascinating, you know, reading these old mm -hmm. slang terms. Mm -hmm. Now, I mentioned our old friend Edward Bulwer-Lytton. <laughs> yeah, he comes up surprisingly often. He's He's such an interesting character. He is, of course, known for all these cliches mm -hmm. and, you know, it was a dark and stormy night and that sort of thing. He uses Bugaboo in his novel Pelham, which is the, the story basically of an upper class dandy. Mm -hmm. So this would, would have been a sort of in term at right. that time. One of those slangy things with the yeah. fast crowd. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, in that novel, he uses a lot of that sort of in lingo mm -hmm. to sort of characterize his characters. So that would have been, that term bugaboo would have been, you know, a popular term at the time. And I'll just, I'll just read the, the sentence that, because it's quite, it's quite fun. He writes, many a mad prank, which I should not like the bugaboos and bulkies to know. <laughs> so bulky is another slang term for police officer. Right. And uh, just one other little fact about him. Not only is he, is he known for you know, his use of these various words and his cliches. He's also uh, responsible for the fact that black is the color of formal wear for men. So, you know, tuxedos yeah, and yeah. so forth. Because in the novel Pelham, he has his fanc fancy dandy mm -hmm. men wearing black to their upper class fancy occasions. And that's, and it that set was the all? trend. Oh. Because it was so, it was this was a pot boiler right. big success book, huh. and I think I'd heard stuff about it being um, the really fancy, the dandy who said oh, Bo Brummel. Bro, Bo Brummel wore dark colors, okay, but not black, black. specifically. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so again, he'll yeah. probably come up in again. something else again. <laughs> He's such an someday, interesting fellow. Someday, maybe you should do a video just on him. Just on him. That's true. Actually, he has a lot of connections. He does. <laughs> Now, I mentioned that burglar is unrelated to bug, mm -hmm. but I neglected to give the etymology of burglar, <laughs> which I suppose is interesting in itself. It comes from medieval Latin burgus, which comes from a Germanic root. So it was borrowed into medieval mm -hmm. Latin from a Germanic root. That means fortified place. Right. So burg and burrow are mm -hmm. related to that word. It could possibly be more distantly related to the Latin word fortis. Right. 
I'm remembering this from the History of English podcast. Ah, okay. He talks about, he talks it. about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Good. We okay. have mentioned that podcast to you people, right? You should be listening to you the History of English podcast if we haven't mentioned it it's, or you aren't. It's a very go. detailed... I mean, don't stop listening to us right, right now, now. <laughs> but <laughs> when you've done this episode, go listen to it. It's, it's fabulous. It's fabulous. It's a, it's a wonderfully detailed... Slow um, in the sense that it moves so carefully through, through stuff, everything. but it's... Everything's very well explained, really interesting, well researched. It's and it really holds the attention, yeah. I'm going to put a link in the show notes for you. (laughs) So the burglar alarm is another interesting piece of that story. You didn't explain why a burglar comes from the word for a fortified city. I mean, why is a burglar from a word for For, a fortified fortified, place? Fortified place. Yes. Let me just pull that up. Hold on. Because it's not a self-evident thing that you would say, oh, yes, a fortified hill or town gives us the word for a person who steals things. So... Yes, the first form of burglar is burgulator, <laughs> which is awesome. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, in 13th century Anglo-Latin texts, and it appears in Anglo-Norman legal documents of the 15th century as burglar. So mm-hmm. it changes its forms. So burg plunderer, which appears in Old French burgor robber, the verb burgle is backdated from burglar. So basically the idea is it's sort of the town thief, I guess. Okay. But the Lator ending is not a, doesn't mean thief. No. Unless it's from Latus, like having picked up? No, it wouldn't be, would it? Latro. Oh, Latronum. Oh, okay. Now it all makes sense. Latro, Latronum is thief Thief. in Latin. So it's Berg, Latro. Latro. Yeah. Not Lator, and then it got turned into Lator because that's a standard Latin Latinate ending for a person who does something. Right. That's essentially an acorn. Then it's a word that yes. was formed one way and then got reinterpreted to be a different kind of word. Yeah. And then sound changes happened. So yeah. it was a thief of a town. town. Berg Lator. Yeah. Berg, Berg Berg Latro. Latro. Yes. Berg Latronus, but then instead of being Latronus, it became Berg Lator. Yeah. And then they said, oh, well, Lator is just the ending of a, means someone who does something. So right. burgle, burgle. Yeah. is then the verb yeah. to burgle. To burgle, yeah. Because you are burgle later. Yes. And then burglar is just burgle. a shortened form yeah. of that. Okay, that is neat. I had not <laughs> heard that. And that is cool because it's one of these things where burgle shouldn't mean, it should mean be a town. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which obviously doesn't. Okay, sorry, you may now proceed to talk about burglar alarms. So burglar alarms. Before Edwin Holmes came up with the idea of a central monitoring station in which to which all the burglar alarms were connected by the telegraph, of course, mm-hmm. there was actually another inventor who came up with the idea of having a central monitoring station. They weren't connected to burglar alarms, in other words, sensors on the windows and doors and so right. forth. Instead, his idea was to have just an emergency call box. Right. So you press a button mm-hmm. to call the police. Like the ones in banks and yeah. things like that where they have under the under the counter. Yeah, exactly. A silent a silent uh, burglar alarm. A silent burglar alarm. Yeah. Uh so that inventor was Edward A. Callahan. Okay. Now, Callahan is an interesting figure for other reasons. Mm-hmm. Well, first of all, he came up with that idea for the call box alarm when the president of the of a company that was implementing his previous invention was burgled. <laughs> so <laughs> right. wanted to do something nice for the boss, I guess. Right. That previous invention yeah. was uh, also used telegraph lines. Uh-huh. So this is kind of his thing, coming up with new ways, ways of using that. telegraph yeah. lines. And it is the stock ticker. Ah. Yeah. So the stock ticker with it, the ticker tape, you yeah. know, that yeah. the spews old out, the old yeah. fashioned thing that spews out the prices of various stocks and commodities and whatnot. Mm, on a sort of ongoing loop. Yeah. Ongoing loop. Yeah. The mechanism that he used for this, the sort of clockwork powered telegraph printing system to print out whatever the information was, was invented by none other than David Edward Hughes, the guy who who first invented the oh, carbon right. microphone, right. But, didn't but didn't patent, patent it. it. Right. And I, I I couldn't find any specific reference to this, but presumably he didn't patent this printing mechanism either, mm. which is why Callahan was, I suppose, able to use it in his... Right. So he was bad at the, good at the inventing, bad at the patenting. Yes. Yeah. Well, 
he he was high minded about it. He specifically right. oh, did wait, it. Oh wait, he's not the one who was beaten to it. He's the no. one who who just didn't who, do it. Yeah, Sorry. Who I just, can't keep them all yeah. straight. <laughs> There's a lot of them. <laughs> he's he's the open source guy, right, right? For the good of science and and progress. Right. Maybe we can include a picture of this device. Uh -huh. uh, he uses. Hughes's device, the, the the little printing mechanism, because it, it's really cool. It looks like a, a weird musical instrument. Instead of having a kind of keyboard that we would recognize, like a computer keyboard or whatever yeah. now, it's got what looks like piano keys. Huh. So okay, it looks yeah. like this weird musical instrument. Yeah. Neat. But it's, it's quite cool. Cool. Well, the burglar alarm, of course, that you mention as the ancient equivalent it's not really, is the geese, Juno's geese. Yes. In the in the video, you talk about the... The guard dogs. Guard dogs, but which are, of course, and... Why, guard, why not other animals? Yeah. Well, and in fact, apparently they have been used in various... I mean, they are... Geese are noisy and they're mm -hmm. territorial, so they do kick up a fuss when people come yeah. into the barnyard. And they can be used sometimes as sort of guard dogs for other animals. So yeah. like they go out with the chickens and things like that. Because, I think that's common practice yeah. with pol poultry, or was at least yeah. common practice yeah. with poultry farmers to put geese in with the with the chickens. Because they were A, more aggressive, yeah. and they drive things off. And also they kick up such a fuss that if there was a predator hear, or yeah. something, a fox at the... Yeah, a fox at the hen house. At the hen house. But specifically Juno's geese, since you did mention it, I thought I could... Um, so this is one of the two origin stories for the foundation of the Temple of Juno Moneta, mm -hmm. Juno Moneta on the hill, uh, the Capitoline Hill, and that's the origin of the word money. Money. Because mm -hmm. Juno Moneta was the, that temple was where they- They minted coins, Well, at first right? they kept the treasury and then later minted, minted coins. coins, yeah. Right. And so it was the money place. Right. It was the place, and so Moneta became uh, generalized into a word for mints. Right. And then eventually into a verb. Right. And so, but it means Juno, the one who gives a warning is yeah. how it was interpreted by the Romans. And there are two stories about it. One is that she, a voice spoke from the temple, a warning of an earthquake. Mm -hmm. But then the other one is this one of the geese. And Livy gives the story of the, this is the attack of the Gauls in the fourth century BC on Rome. The sack, they've sacked the city and yeah. everybody's retreated to the citadel. So they're all up on the Capitoline Hill in the citadel. And then the Gauls notice a way up, the, a back way up that a messenger had taken. So choose, and I'm going to read a little bit from Livy Book 5. Choosing a night when there was a faint glimmer of light, they sent an unarmed man in advance to try the road, then handing one another their arms where the path was difficult and supporting each other, dragging each other up as the ground required, they finally reached the summit. So silent had their movements been that not only were they unnoticed by the sentinels, but they did not even wake the dogs, an animal peculiarly sensitive to nocturnal sounds. But they did not escape the notice of the geese, which were sacred to Juno and had been left untouched in spite of the extremely scanty supply of food. Of course, they've been being right. barricaded and, yeah, and yeah, starved yeah. out for a while. This proved the safety of the garrison, for their clamor and the noise of their wings aroused Marcus Manlius, the distinguished soldier who had been consul three years before. He snatched up his weapons and ran to call the rest to arms, and while the rest hung back, he struck with the boss of his shield a gall who had got a foothold on the summit and knocked him down. And he fell on those behind and upset them, and he slew the others. So then they drove them off, and then they were able to take better precautions. And in the end, various things happened, including the sentinel who slept on the job or who didn't get right. woken up being thrown off the Tarpeian rock by Thanks. the rest of the army and Manlius being brought a tribute of grain and wine from everybody else. Uh -huh. uh, all the other soldiers brought him some to thank him. So various other things, but so even better than dogs, even better than dogs, at least in this particular account. So uh, that's the, the story of Juno's geese. Now why the geese are sacred to Juno is a separate issue and not one that's particularly explained. Right. But there's lots of, cases of various birds or animals being sacred to gods right right and goddesses so there's your juno's geese so there's your i just thought i'd give a little expansion of the burglar yes. alarm story excellent now the next thing that i kind of want us to discuss because i think we both have something to say about this is the ideas of authorship and control of intellectual property authorship was certainly important in, in the ancient world right yeah Absolutely. We have things like the sphragma, the seal. Sphragma is a Greek mm -hmm. word that means seal, an actual physical seal like that you would stamp on something to close it, like on a you right. clay over a, the opening of a mm -hmm. document, and then you'd mm -hmm. stamp it with your seal that you kept it that mm -hmm. was like your signature. But metaphorically, on poetry, 
in particular, poets would work in their name at the end, ah, you know, at yeah, the end of the right. beginning, but somewhere into the actual text of their poem and say, this was written by... Like a, like a watermark it is. Yeah. sort of thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, so that it couldn't be removed without marring the poem. Right. And that was their sfrag, it was known as a sfragma, as the seal. So right. they certainly did want authorship yeah. uh, recognized. And a big part of knowing your poetry, or your, in particular with poetry, obviously with prose as well, but poetry would just have a lot longer uh, history of, of this stuff, um, you know, is knowing the authors and knowing mm -hmm. who wrote what and all the rest of it. That said, there's also a lot of misattributed stuff. Yeah. But I'd come back to that. But beyond that, uh, the importance of authorship, mm -hmm. there was no other sense of control of intellectual property, right? You know, no. people could reprint your poems or whatever. And well, in fact, that, that was the only way that they would be, that would the only way they'd be distributed. I yeah. mean, the idea of a publishing house that controlled the publication of something and then distributed them for sale, it might have been a little bit of that in places like Rome, but basically there wasn't. If you, the way you publish something was you brought it down to the booksellers who put their scribes to recopying it. Right. And then the bookseller made money on it. Right. <laughs> Maybe there'd be a sort of commission thing, but once it got out of his hands, anybody could recopy right, it. Right, right. It's just that copying and writing and the materials for writing were fairly restrictive mm -hmm. and difficult and expensive. So most people would buy a copy of something rather than copy it themselves just because right. they didn't necessarily have the capability or yeah, the, yeah. the wherewithal to do it. But it wasn't, there was no concept whatsoever of copyright yeah. and there was no concept of ownership of an idea. Yeah. And I imagine, I mean, the, you, you know, your average Roman writer is an upper class person who would not really relish the idea of making money off of Writing. That, yes, depends what time you're talking about. And we can, right. we don't need to get into the details of that, but there's a trajectory. The first Roman writers were paid and were oh. slaves or ex-slaves. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and then there's a sort of a, a moving up the social scale. So you, you go back to Ennius. Mm -hmm. He's a foreigner. He's a Greek. He's right. not, you know, he's an Oscan and a Greek and barely a Roman. Not a slave, as far as we can tell, but and Andronicus and who and uh, the earliest play uh, playwrights and all of that, they are commissioned. Okay, so that's how you make the money, that's how right? You you, money. you are right. commissioned by somebody to write, either by the state. So the earliest Plautus and Terence are both either slaves or ex-slaves, according wow. to okay. tradition. Right. Whether they really were is another issue. We know nothing about their lives, really. But that was the tradition. Certainly, they were not upper class, mm -hmm. so they were commissioned by the state to write the plays for. Mm -hmm state festivals or people the first poems are in Rome are epics and they're commissioned by the people who the epics are about right. <laughs> to, okay. to yeah. glorify yeah. them and their family so you make the money on the commission and then it's in the interest of the person who commissioned you to spread it as far as possible because right. the reason the, they commissioned the, it is so that everybody would read it the person who commissions it is not going to try and make money off of it no no they commission they, it for they a different want it reason for, for propaganda purposes yeah. or whatever yeah or yeah. the state festival wants to put on the play and right. either they charge people or most likely they don't because it was mm -hmm. a religious festival right so that's the purpose of it so there's just no idea of making money off copies of the work mm -hmm. Over time, for a variety of reasons I won't get into now, the idea of making of writing mm -hmm. and creative work moves up the social scale mm -hmm. and becomes a leisure activity for the rich. Right. And then you have a transformation. Now nobody's commissioned. Now to be, as you say, yeah. from that point on, so we're talking at the beginning of the first century BC, really, it's shifting. Mm -hmm. And now there are still people who write for commission. Cicero has a long, has a, has a defense of a Greek poet, for instance, who, mm -hmm. Archias, who writes on commission still. So right. there still are people, but most of the poets who survived from that period are upper class leisured people right. who are not writing for commission right. and who therefore are definitely not going to try to make money off their right. work. Though there's this also this poor poet persona. Right. But the way you might make money though, if you did, so later on under the empire, you get Statius and Marshall and people like that who do make a living off their poetry. Hmm. And I mean, in a way, so does Horace and so does Virgil. So does Virgil. But you do it through patronage. Right. Right? So you make money in the sense that you are given gifts by the great men who want to nurture your talent. Right. And perhaps you write about them in this way. But that's not a commission because that would be vulgar and gross. But right, right. you somehow nonetheless end up with a farm in the countryside and happen to have written some poems about this guy mm -hmm. who gave it to you. But no connection between the two things. Right. right? So it becomes this complicated thing. But in any of those cases, there isn't really any... Um, 
incentive for somebody to restrict the promulgation of their works. Right, right. And even with Marshall or Statius, who are definitely trying to sort of make money off of it, what they're really doing is they're promising people, I'll write a poem about you if you, you know, eat, take me to dinner or give right. me a, po- a present. Right. But then once the poem is written, it's in everybody's interests. To spread that it, it be as spread wide as wide as possible. Right. So there really is no incentive. And in a sense, that's true in the Greek world as well. The mechanics are slightly different and the class implications are different. But you have you have people like Pindar, who is writing uh, victory odes for winners of the Olympic mm-hmm. Games. Again, he's being commissioned by them. And then once they're written, everybody wants them spread. What about the playwrights? They're writing essentially for a religious festival. Yeah. But again, they're commissioned they're, mm. by the Koregos. So... It is the job of, there's a job that's farmed out to the richest people, and mm-hmm. it's essentially a type of form of tax. Okay. Some of them have to produce triremes, some of them have to do other things. One of the main things they have to do is they have to pay a playwright, pay the chorus, train the chorus, mm-hmm. and put it on. So again, they'd be, they'd be paid for the act of writing. Right. Okay. And in fact, those plays were probably not published in any kind of formal way until no, way yeah, later. Yeah. What mostly probably circulated, at least at first, would be um, actor's scripts. Right. Okay. But that's that's all a little murky. We don't know exactly mm-hmm. this history of that. But yeah. So yes, no publishing industry in the sense we mean it. There's mm-hmm. a book selling industry, right. bookmakers and booksellers, and they have an interest in finding the best poets because more people will buy their books. Right. But there's no direct royalty idea or yeah, anything yeah. like that. So yeah, there's no protection of property that way. But in all of this, you can see why protection of authorship is important. The poet wants, wants everyone to, to know be, it's, his, it's poems. his poems. So he can so, get more commissions or exactly, whatever. Exactly. Yeah. More fame, more commissions, more popularity. Uh, the person who has the poem written about him wants that everybody know that this great poet wrote about them, if they're well right. known. You know, right. So all that attribution's important. Right. And so in that sense, it's like the creative commons now. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. Attribution's really important. Right. But not restriction on copyright. Right. Well, in some forms of creative commons anyway. Well, I mean, these notions are more or less the same in the Middle Ages. Mm-hmm. There's no sense of controlling intellectual property like writing. Yeah. But authorship is still, in some cases anyways, an important thing. So poets will do that same idea mm-hmm. of mentioning themselves or talking about themselves in the in the work. That's one of the places where you get those acrostics, right? Acrostics. Which has been in the yeah. news recently with those letters of resignation by, the, by various yes. Trump member yeah, yeah, yeah. committee members who've had acrostics in the first letters of their paragraphs of right. letters of resignation. But acrostics where you have the first line, letter of every line, say, yeah. <clears throat> spells out the name of the poet. Yeah. For instance. Even in, so. even in old English literature, one of the poets that we know of by name, we only know the name because... It's in the poem. In, in a in, r- riddling way. Yeah. In a riddling way. So Kuna Wolf. Yeah, I think um, you talked about that in another episode. I can't remember now. Mm. But the one place that we do see uh, an interest in controlling knowledge, mm-hmm. controlling ideas, is in craft secrecy. Right. Guilds right. would protect the no- the various secret techniques that they use mm-hmm. and so forth. And so there was an interest in, in maintaining that control. Yeah. And that that's probably more formalized in the Middle Ages, but it's definitely something you see in the ancient world as well. Yeah. There's definitely the idea of techne or craft or skill that is in some way arcane right. and hidden. And the other place you get that is like the religious mysteries. Right. So in, you could call that a type of intellectual property, property. you know, yeah. that you have to keep the secrets of how one gets to the afterlife yeah. and, you know, those kinds of things secret. Yeah. And so, for instance, the earliest mention of windmills as a technology right. is in a diploma granting monopoly to build windmills in a particular area. Now, mm-hmm. it's not certain that this was an original technology. The technology could have existed before that. Right. But this is the first mention, mention that, that we have, have of it. Yeah. What we do know is that the first systematic patent laws come from Venice. Yeah, you mentioned I that. mentioned yeah. that. And are associated, again, with a kind of craft, right? Mm-hmm. So it's the glass blowers. Ah, uh, right. Yes. Right. So it's not certain, but I think we can connect the dots there that patent laws grow out of craft guilds. Mm-hmm. No, that makes sense, sense because yeah. that's the craft guilds are the first regular, are, are the main, not the first, but the re- major regulators of industry. Yeah, yeah. And as industry becomes more industrial, essentially, and in, and innovative, mm-hmm. I don't say that word that way. Innovative. That's how I say that word. What am I doing? <laughs> yeah, so that makes sense. Mm-hmm. 
And the earliest that we have this a patent with the element of novelty, that it has to be a new invention, okay, right. that doesn't really occur until King Henry II of France. Okay. So that's when novelty becomes an important element of getting a patent, right? Right. You can't patent. Before that, you could just patent you could have, in, it's, in a It's region. essentially a monopoly. Monopoly, yeah. I'm the only one who's allowed to do this thing. To have this, to use have this, this technology, technology in this place. In this city. Um, and that would be granted to them by, you know, the mm -hmm. powers that be. But from then on, we get this notion that it has to be a new technology to be granted the patent. Exclusivity. Exclusivity. Right. Yeah. Some other things that are interesting to mention, design patents are another thing. Mm -hmm. So in 1502, we have a design patent being granted for italic type. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, which was a way of fitting more text, more text into, into the same space. The same yeah. space. Uh, mm -hmm. It was granted to Aldus Manutius, <laughs> who is also important for having invented the modern use of the semicolon <laughs> and the modern appearance of the comma. Do you know that today is National Ampersand Day? Ampersand Day, yes. It's not the same, but hey, it's punctuation. Punctuation, <laughs> yeah. And the earliest literary reference to patents mm -hmm. beyond, you know, the sort documentary of legal evidence, documentary yeah. evidence is in a play by Ben Johnson called The Devil is an Ass, <laughs> in which he makes fun of what he calls projectors, people who do projects, I guess. Okay. Projectors. <laughs> in other words, inventors slash swindlers, because they're made out to be kind of crooks. Right, right. There's a character, Meercraft, who is trying to get a patent for individually wrapped toothpicks with instructions on how to use them. <laughs> Ridiculous so, sometimes, idea. Sometimes satire is sort of ageless, you say. <laughs> I mean, you could do the same thing now as a joke, mm -hmm. and it would only barely be a joke. <laughs> and this Meercraft is also trying to get a patent for forks. Right. The fork at that time in England was just being introduced from Italy. It already mm -hmm. existed in Italy. And so it was being introduced, it was starting to be used in England as well. And because of this fork reference, it seems that Johnson was making fun of an actual person. Okay. A travel writer named Thomas Coriate, who was did indeed introducing. introduce the fork from Italy into England. Right. As well as the word umbrella. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and for his fork pioneering ways, <laughs> he was given the punning Latin nickname Furkifer. <laughs> That's a pun because Furkifer means thief. Thief. To get us back to our latro. Yeah. He's a thief, but it means a thief because it is somebody who is who, who is born on the cross, who's carried on a cross. Right. Because kind you of... you crucify thieves. Right. Yeah. So it's somebody who's um, going to be punished that way. Mm -hmm. That's it doesn't have anything to do with actual the thieving. It's just the punishment. But the firk is the cross or or um, a yoke or yoke or a, fork shaped a fork shaped thing. I think at one point I heard that it had something to do with the crucifixions also happening at forks in the road. Is yeah, that, that true might be or not? Um, certainly. Executions of thieves did happen at, at crossroads. Right. Hangings and things like mm -hmm. that. So yeah, the, they may have all kind of come together. Come together there. I'm not yeah. totally certain exactly what the etymology is, but that's what it essentially means. So yes, a furcifer would be a scoundrel or a thief, yeah. but he's also the carrier, fair, fair right. of a fork. A fork. A fork carrier. Fork carrier. He carried the fork, the fork from yes. Italy. Italy, so. yeah. Oh, that clever Ben Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> it's like he had a way with words or something. Yep. All right. Well, that brings me to what I want to end with because it takes us full circle, I think. Mm -hmm. It takes us back to bugs and it takes us to attributions and puns, actually, in some mm -hmm. ways, or at least silliness. There is a poem called The Gnat, <laughs> probably written, a little hard to tell, but it's probably written sometime in the first century AD. Mm -hmm. But the reason it's hard to tell is because it only exists in a manuscript. Our earliest manuscript was collected by Josephus Eustace Gallagher, the Dutch philologist and historian, in 1572, and he called it the Virgilian Appendix. And it's a sort of collection of a number of poems that had been credited to Virgil. So here we have this idea of authorship. Obviously, the issue is if having the right name of a, on a poem is mm -hmm. important, then if you're going to write a poem and you want your booksellers to sell it, 
Put a false name. Put a false name on it, right? Put the name of a famous guy. Yeah. Or if there's poems c- cooking around and you are a bookseller and you want to sell it better, stick a name onto it. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, either you could call them forgeries or that they're just misattributed or maybe both. But one way or another, and we have a and there's a tradition of this with almost every major right. author. We have Tabuliana, there's there's poems that are collected together with the Tabulus poems right. that are not by Tabulus and pseudo Tabulus. And then and there's all the medieval pseudo whatever is right. Whatever. And then there's <laughs> a lot of classical pseudo this, that, and the others yeah. too. So this is very common. But there's this one set of poems known as Virgiliana or the Virgilian mm. Appendix. There are people who argue that one or more of the poems might be his juvenilia. And that was how they were sort of assumed to be. They were assumed to be his youthful right. poems, some of them. Do we have any are... guesses as to when these were misattributed? I mean, it's kind of hard since our earliest The introduction manuscript. to this translation says, There had been a tradition of crediting Virgil with the writing of various of these poems, and Statius, Lucan, Martial, Quintilian, and Suetonius could all be cited, not always directly or convincingly, as authorities. Huh. So, I mean, a fairly early tradition okay. of some of these poems being, to some degree, attributed to Virgil, which makes some sense because, you know, it was the time when everybody loved Virgil the most right, in right, some right. ways, okay. right? But they almost certainly are not by Virgil. Right. However, that doesn't mean that they were written as fakes. Right. As I say, it's they misattri- could have just been written, written and, and then, then somebody else attributed them attributed to Virgil. To, they don't yeah. say in them that they're by Virgil or anything. Right. All right. So that sort of touches on our issue of authorship, authorship. and the, mm-hmm. the issues of intellectual property. But the poem is also called The Gnat, and so it's about a bug. bug. So I thought I would read a few bits. Now, what it is, is it's a, it's a humorous epilion, little ep- mini epic. Okay. But it, and it's sort of addressed to Augustus, and it starts off, and it goes on for a while, and it says, I'm going to write you, but it's not going to, uh, an epic, but it's not going to be about all those big epic topics. And then it talks about the big epic topics for, you know, 200 lines that he's not going to talk about. <laughs> he spends 200 lines right. talking about how he's not going to talk about them. And then it's, it becomes the story of a shepherd. A shepherd who goes out to watch his sheep and lays down to have a nap and a giant snake comes out and is about to attack him. Mm-hmm. And he's lying there and he's in, and he's asleep and it's very, it, it, it's very overwrought in its style and it goes yes. on and on and on. But he is, in the nick of time, a little gnat alights on his eye and bites him and wakes him up. So I'll read that bit. The shepherd, as we remember, is lost to the world and cannot have any idea of the terrible danger closing upon him. And then? And then what happens? One of nature's nurslings arrives in time to warn him, stinging his eyelid to rouse him and warn him that death impends. It has picked a tender place, either by chance or else, if this is a fable, then knowing that this is the quickest way to wake him up, and time, as they often say in the courtrooms, is of the essence. The eye hurts, and the shepherd wakes and strikes the little gnat dead. What sacrifice to lay down one's life for another creature, but the poor gnat has been crushed and become a tiny smudge on the shepherd's weathered face. It's then that he sees the serpent and coiled, and then he manages to kill the snake and right. he's saved. So he stumbles home, and it's all, then it goes on and on. He goes home and lies down to sleep. He drifts off, and his limbs relax, and his mind lets go of the outer world. But into its inviting arena comes the minuscule ghost of the poor gnat <laughs> to inveigh against injustice and complain of ingratitude. Is this how I am repaid for my concern and aid that saved your life? Aware of the risk to my own safety, I roused you nonetheless. And look at me now. I roam through the emptiness of space while you stretch out to sleep, having been snatched from the very lip of a yawning grave and an agonizing death. And then the gnat continues to talk and describes, it's like 500 lines of it, describes the underworld in great detail and all the things <laughs> it's seen in the detail and in in the underworld and how miserable it is because it can't, it's unburied, so it mm. can't cross over the sticks properly and it's doomed to wander with the criminals and how could this be right because he's such a hero and it goes <laughs> on and on and on and, 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 and tells a long story about um, Telamon and Peleus and Ajax and Achilles and stuff to, to as a parallel to his own poor situation. And the, talks about seeing the Romans in the underworld. In many ways, it's a parody of mm-hmm. Aeneas in the underworld in Virgil's Aeneid, right? Who sees mm-hmm. the long and has described to him that sees the many ghosts of Homeric epic and then of right. Roman history stretched out in the underworld. So this gnat sees all of this as well. And finally says, I am a mere gnat, but I shall miss the springtime, the green groves of the forest, the sweet smells of the meadows. My complaint may seem small, like me, but what I did, I did for you. And can you allow the random breezes to disperse my posthumous words and obliterate the truth? This is all he had to say. Then with a small wine that gnats produce, 
when they fly, he disappeared. The shepherd woke up soon enough that he could remember his dream. Or was it a visitation? His heart was flooded with sorrow and bitter chagrin. He arose and returned to that glade where he started to dig in the grassy sod, marking out on a circle where he could set the stones fashioned from polished marble. So he builds a monument, which is described in great detail, puts flowers all over it. And then upon its face, he put a plaque with an epitaph. O Nat, your body was tiny, but your heart and courage were huge. A grateful shepherd pays you this tribute for saving his life. And that's the last lines of the poem. <laughs> so this is, I guess, what we in English literature circles would refer to as the kind of burlesque that's known as a mock epic. Yes. yes. So high style, you know. And, and low subject. And low subject. Yeah. And yeah. absolutely. And there are others in this tradition. There are ones in the Greek tradition as well. There's a mock ep epic about the battle of the frogs and mice, for instance, that we have only in fragments. But yeah, so there's... You know, this is something that, of course, people were amused by right. um, from the very beginning. But yes, it also takes a little bit of an edge from a, another tradition in the Hellenistic period and the Roman period of mock epitaphs, mock and real epitaphs for pets oh. and animals, huh. where there are like gravestones or epigrams just little poems pet graveyards <laughs> for and and that's um one of the ones that uh, Catullus is playing with with his uh poems about the sparrow who dies uh, his his girl's pet hmm. sparrow where you sort of again you have these like epitaphs to the dead pet in a very high style right um about the wonderful but it's about an animal mm -hmm. so it's the mix of of high and low right yeah so absolutely and the poem is is all the way through and the, the idea that it's a shepherd is low style too it's right. inappropriate it's an inappropriate genre right. for the topic but i thought it was entertaining and i should just add of course that the word that I'm, is being translated as gnat is kulex so kulex just a word for hmm. for a particular kind of biting insect biting insect mm -hmm. well and indeed that's what gnat probably the english word gnat probably means connected to gnaw gnaw right yeah, yeah. And picking up on something we mentioned earlier, I couldn't find a word for bogies in Latin in oh. the snot sense. But snot, of course, is mucus. Oh, mucus, of course. So, And there's a, a related word in Greek. So right. that's as close as I could get us. <laughs> and on that edifying note, <laughs> I think we should end because this has actually been quite a extensive discussion. Mm -hmm. From such small things, bugs may be small, but their hearts are large, Mark. <laughs> So let's end it there and we can go off and read our fake Virgil. <laughs> There's also a, one of his other poems in the same collection is uh, about pesto. 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 Oh, wow. It's called Moretum, but it's about, basically it's a long description of a farmer's wife, a shepherd's wife making him like pounded cheese and garlic and herbs. Yeah. Sounds like pesto. pesto. <laughs> in a mortar and pestle. Mm. So, yeah. So, you know, it's a not so famous element of Roman poetry, but it's quite entertaining. And oh, by the way, that translation I read was a fairly new translation by David R. Slavitt, just if you're oh. interested in looking for it, called The Gnat and Other Minor Poems of Virgil. Okay. It's an interesting collection of poems, and it's a good readable translation that's mm. written as a, you know, written for English lovers of poetry. Right. Rather than as a crib for classics. Right. So if you're interested in it, you can pick that up. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll be back soon. But in the meantime... I hope you're not being too bugged <laughs> in any of the senses of the word, all of which I think possibly applied these days to most of our lives. Mm -hmm. We can be bugged in all sorts of manners. <laughs> and our grasshoppers are finished. Thank goodness. So, <laughs> <laughs> so fare thee well. Bye-bye. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.